So yeah, so uh, today I'm basically just gonna kind of do a crash course in using Houdini for scientific visualization. Um, so this is maybe gonna be a little bit different from uh, some of the other talks, but I'm uh, hoping we synthesize some cool uh, new ideas. So, um, so as Chris mentioned, my career started 15 years ago at the National Center for Supercomputing Applications at the University of Illinois. Um, we did a bunch of uh, digital full dome planetarium shows, uh, like documentary films, um, and also a couple IMAX things, but documentary filmmaking was kind of the, the main mode of presentation there. Um, during that time, I took a sabbatical, went to Double Negative, and worked on the movie Interstellar. Um, they uh, asked me to join because my reel had a bunch of space stuff, but this was also a really good opportunity to jumpstart my, uh, my uh, use of Houdini. Um, but before that, we were mostly a, a Maya group, and when I came back to the university after Interstellar, we became a Houdini group. Um, and then uh, my, uh, the director of our team retired, and I decided I should probably go hang out with NASA, and um, I kind of got them going on Houdini as well. So, um, so we're sort of now in the process of, um, the, the NASA approach is less uh, documentarian and more about uh, helping do public outreach for cutting edge science. So uh, we work directly with scientists to kind of uh, do various things that help with their science outreach mission. Uh, everything that we produce is funded by the public and so it's put online. Um, but then we also um, will work with news agencies and YouTubers and um, uh, you know, museums and all kinds of different things. Uh, basically just to try and get science stories out into the public. So um, before I go too deep into the Houdini stuff, I kind of just want to define what I mean by scientific visualization. Um, so a lot of people uh, hear the term data visualization, and I would say that probably 95% of the, of the data visualization that you encounter is what we actually refer to as information visualization. So that's 2D charts and graphs that uh, talk about like relational data um, that doesn't have like an inherent geometric property. Uh, when I talk about scientific visualization, I'm talking about specifically making like scientifically accurate imagery of three-dimensional data that has like an inherent spatial quality to it. Um, so comparing scientific visualization to VFX, um, the, the way that we do scientific visualization, and there's a million different ways to do it, um, is very similar to v the, the VFX pipeline. But I would say that kind of the biggest difference is um, the way that we treat drama and realism. Uh, my impression, at least, is that in the VFX world, um, the goal is to heighten the drama as much as possible and at as reduced a cost as possible. And so there's a lot of um, efficiencies and hidden things that, uh, that are part of the VFX pipeline. Um, you know, we're, we're funded by tax dollars, so the, the capitalist, like, need to save money isn't quite as strong. Um, not, that, not that we're flush with cash, but uh, we have the ability to uh, explore and do research. Um, and so uh, our goal is really to uh, try and make reality look as good as possible. Um, so there's, there's also sort of a, you know, we would like to have the excitement and the drama, but we, we can't stray from the realism. So um, when we're working with data, like the data has to come from somewhere, right? Um, so at NASA, we mostly get our data from two sources. The first is um, observational data. So we have a ton of sensors and instruments uh, all over Earth. We have things in the ocean. We have airplanes flying through the sky. We also have satellites that are looking down at Earth and out into space. We've got you know, robots and other planets. Um, we've got observational data out the wazoo. Uh, we also... Uh, have computational models. Um, so the, the, these are some of the supercomputers that I've worked with data from over the years. Um, these are you know, physical simulations based on first principles. Uh, similar idea to what DOPS is doing in Houdini, but just like on steroids. Uh, the, the, you know, there's absolutely no negligible friction. There's, uh, there's all kinds of things that like you would never even think of that the scientists have thought of to put in to try and make the most absolutely accurate representation of a physical phenomenon that they can. 
Um, in every talk I give, I have to make a comment that like, just because it's data doesn't mean it's truth. Um, I'm gonna kind of glaze over that in this talk because this is a Houdini talk, but I did see this presentation earlier this year at the Outlier Visualization Conference, and I would highly recommend checking it out. This talks about kind of the um, potential to lie with, with uh, visual imagery with data visualization, um, and it's all couched in this uh, framework of like, what if uh, Florida was actually run by alligators and they really want climate change to happen? Um, so I, I highly recommend checking it out. I think it was a really great talk. Um, so these are, I'm just gonna share a few examples of data visualizations that I've done um, and uh, some interesting quirks about how we used Houdini to do them. So uh, this visualization is of a, uh, it's of Earth's magnetosphere and it represents a, um, a coronal mass ejection that was launched off the sun and hit the magnetosphere um, disrupted a lot of uh, uh, satellites. Um, it actually, this is the one that famously knocked out a bunch of uh, those small internet satellites. Um, and uh, we, um, uh, yeah, the, the, uh, the data uh, came to us as this very unusual sort of egg shape of data. Um, we, uh, we were working directly with the scientist and one of the things that he wanted us to draw out was actually the fact that uh, when a coronal mass ejection comes through Earth's magnetosphere, it creates turbulence in the magnetic field. And so you tend to think of the solar wind as always going away from the sun, but there's actually a, sort of a point in that solar wind where um, in the sort of the shadow on the backside of Earth, the solar wind comes back toward the, the, the planet at times. And so um, they're sort of where you see bright blue in this visualization. Those lines are basically demonstrating where the solar wind is, is uh, sort of coming back toward the Earth. Um, so I just wanted to share that as kind of an example of like searching for a phenomenon in the data. A lot of times we sort of have to do this hide and seek uh, exercise where we, where we find things that the scientists know should be there, uh, but we have to visually highlight them. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more later about uh, how, we, how we load these sort of a, uh, atypical uh, uh, volume formats into Houdini, but this is just kind of a look. These, uh, every point you see in those charts at the top of the screen uh, represents the center of a voxel. So this data set was, was um, basically optimized so that all of the resolution was near where uh, the bow shock and the, the earth was, but um, there still was resolution in places where things were happening, and then there were you know, these empty corners in the bounding box, so we weren't calculating things in the corners of, of the box. Um, this is sort of typical for, for scientific data that uh, they only put information where something interesting is happening, uh, and it creates a whole uh, issue for us trying to load it into a, a uniform grid in Houdini. Okay, so this visualization is uh, a, a, the cosmic web of galaxies. So um, there's a lot of uh, scientific data out there about how all of the galaxies in the universe are sort of tied together through these, uh, you know, sort of spiderweb strands of, of gravity and dark matter. And uh, this visualization in particular is representing a early point in the universe where uh, we, um, we see kind of the, the first generation of galaxies. Uh, I really like this visualization because it breaks down how we've uh, sort of split the different uh, fields, uh, how we brought the different fields together basically, gave them each different color characteristics. Uh, but um, you know, kind of in the final visualization, you see just kind of this rainbow and you're like, oh, that's really pretty. It must have just been like a rainbow uh, galaxy to begin with. And it's, it's actually been very carefully constructed to show where metallicity and hydrogen and uh, photogamma are. Oh, and another point I wanted to make about this, this is an adaptive mesh refinement uh, data set. Um, so adaptive mesh refinement is a, a, a multi-resolution grid, so it's sort of like an ox tree, which is sort of what VDBs are, but VDBs all have uh, sort of a uniform base resolution, and in adaptive mesh refinement, any uh, level of resolution in the grid can be a voxel. Um, so I don't think, I don't remember how deep this was. I think this was like eight levels of resolution, but we've worked with data that had like 40 levels of resolution. So there's, there's a, a huge orders of magnitude and scale difference between different voxels. 
Uh, okay, so this data uh, was um, what scientists think was kind of the last major collision between rocky bodies in the early solar system that led to the creation of the Earth and the Moon. Um, this data is smoothed particle hydrodynamics, which is uh, it's a particle simulation, but it's uh, it, the particles represent sort of uh, a distribution through a fluid. So, um, so I think that's kind of what FLIP uh, it does. Um, so, um, so what was cool about this is that uh, the the particles represented basically rock. They they were rock, at, but in different uh, states of matter. So um, we had solid rock, and then we had like molten rock, which was liquid, and then we had rock vapor, like superheated rock that had actually turned into a gas. And so, uh, so we had to use the um, the density, the temperature, and the and the particle radius to figure out which state of matter each particle was in, and then we would surface both the solids and the liquids, and we would uh, put sprites onto the gas particles. And then uh, we rendered the, the solids with a diffuse shader and the liquids with an emissive shader, and we also turned the liquids into geometry light so that they would cast light onto the diffuse part. Um, and then uh, also created like a, a for the gas, we created a, a Gaussian sphere sprite instead of just using 2D cards, um, because the 2D cards were creating these like intersection artifacts when they uh, intersected with the, the surfaces, um, and then uh, and then just like added some procedural noise and came up with this, and uh, we're really pleased with that. Mm. And I was also going to mention um, we we basically made every point in that particle system kind of its own UV tracker, so we stored the initial position of every particle on the particles as they evolved, and then we would go back and like look up their, their UV at the, at the beginning of the simulation so that we could sort of stretch and warp the, um, the image texture that was originally shading the, the originating planets. Uh, so this visualization is of photosynthesis in, a, in an organelle called a chromatophore. So this is sort of an uh, early predecessor of a, a, a chlorophyll in a, in a plant cell. Um, and we, uh, so the, the data that, that we worked with here was, a, was just kind of a box with 100,000 atoms in it that the, the scientists let evolve according to whatever biophysical uh, equations they had. Um, they ended up building or uh, running the, like 60 terabytes of data to create this. Uh, what created what ended up being just like a static uh, shape. Um, so, so then it, the job for us was to figure out like how to animate the energy moving around this static shape. So, so they have sort of some um, visual language that they've created in the field. Uh, around like how you draw these like spiral ribbons to represent DNA and how you show um, molecular chains. Um, but uh, so, so they handed off kind of those derived geometries to us and then we used Houdini to kind of choreograph the way that like the photon came in and created this sort of quantum bouncing effect which passed on uh, to, actually I think that's what the next slide is. So, um, so yeah, so these like LH1 and LH2 molecules captured the quantum energy and then they uh, put the energy into these quinones and quinols that would travel around the surface of the sphere and that would eventually inject uh, energy into a proton that would travel through the center of the sphere and then that would uh, eventually drive the ATB synthase molecule. Um, that's a lot of scientific jibber jabber that you don't really need, but uh, one of the things that I thought was kind of cool uh, that we did for this is we used the find shortest path SOP. Um, so uh, we basically took the outer sphere, booleaned out the, the large molecules and kind of had the gaps between them and then used find shortest path to connect some start and end points across the um, sort of the remainder of the shell uh, and, the, and added a little bit of noise to that that path shape and the scientists saw that and they were really pleased and thought that that looked very accurate to kind of their concept of what it was. Uh, so then I just also want to kind of make the pitch that I do think that the black hole in interstellar qualifies as a scientific visualization. That might not be the first thing people think when they see it, but um, it uh, famously uh, double negative created this gravitational renderer that um, used 
uh, the equations of light and gravity to, to do this, and it was at, at, they were advised by um, astrophysicist Kip Thorne, who was like an expert in the field. And uh, I'm not sure if maybe everyone already knows this, but they, they published a scientific paper uh, where they talked about kind of how they built that, that renderer, and um, they actually talked about creating an even more scientifically accurate black hole. Um, the one that ended up in the film spun at a very high rate that is sort of statistically unlikely, and so they, they made a black hole that was more statistically likely, and they had um, color shift and brightening shift that were um, more accurate to reality, but ended up deciding not to include that in the black hole in the film uh, for reasons of understandability. Um, because they were already kind of stretching the limits of what people knew about black holes by doing the, the lensing effect. Um, and I think a lot of people think of that as like a sacrifice to accuracy, but I would say that that is actually kind of a part of the scientific visualization process, is deciding when understandability is more important than like absolute accuracy. I mean, obviously you don't want to lie, but you, um, you know, sometimes we'll omit things in order to uh, make it more clear what's going on. Um, okay, so now I'm gonna talk about sort of just some common uh, techniques that we use in Houdini to do uh, a lot of things that we do all the time. Uh, so we do pre-visualization like I'm sure a lot of, uh, a lot of the folks in this room. Um, one of the things that pre-visualization is really important for with us is that we uh, are frequently dealing in environments that don't have a, a really easy way to orient yourself. When you're flying through space, there's no up. Um, and so uh, we tend to do a lot of long, unbroken, you know, oneers, um, unbroken camera pads through the data, um, just to help the audience sort of keep their orientation. And so we have to take these massive simulations and come up with proxy geometry that we'll play back in real time so that we can do uh, kind of this nice organic camera choreography. So when I was at the supercomputing center, we had this really cool tool called Virtual Director, which would allow us to use a 3D space pilot mouse to navigate around the data as it was evolving. And so you could kind of very documentary-like react to things as they were happening in the simulation. Um, and when I got to NASA, I was like, oh man, it'd be really great to have a tool like this. Uh, like nothing really existed yet. Um, but I didn't want to write a whole graphics program. You know, this was like a standalone C++ program. Uh, so I went out and got myself a space pilot mouse and just dug into chops and realized that it was really not too challenging to redirect the um, incoming data stream from the mouse uh, into a, a camera and then uh, record that camera motion out, and, uh, and yeah. So, um, so yeah, now I have a, what I call a spacewalk camera where um, I can kind of record an organic camera path in Houdini. Uh, so um, talking about uh, bringing the data into Houdini, um, the, the kinds of data that we, we work with, this is not an exhaustive list, but this is kind of, the major types of data that we work with. Um, we get a lot of satellite imagery. Um, sometimes that comes to us in like strips, you know, as like a satellite circles the globe, it'll, it'll spit out kind of a ribbon of imagery. Um, sometimes it'll come to us as like a global mosaic where someone has already put all those strips together. Um, there's a lot of uh, stereo uh, reconstruction, so like a satellite will have two cameras looking in different directions, and then they'll be able to figure out sort of the 3D geometry of a surface like they did for uh, the asteroid Bennu up there. Um, we'll get like sort of lifetime uh, uh, satellite uh, trajectory paths like in the top right corner, um, evolving volume uh, simulations like in the bottom left corner, Spreadsheets, everyone loves spreadsheets. Uh, this, the bottom center here is like a series of black hole binary systems we've observed through telescopes. Um, and then the bottom right is a particle system, like uh, that's the, the colliding uh, moon simulation that I showed earlier. Um, so to get those data into Houdini, they're almost never in a form, the, the images luckily are uh, usually uh, TIFFs or maybe a geotiff, but um, but pretty much all the other data types you really have to uh, mess with before they're a, a format that Houdini will recognize. Um, so we use a lot of these, uh, these tools here. Um, the, well, 
<laughs> I say that the VFX GUIs we pretty much only use Houdini anymore. Um, but uh, and well, and render man. Okay, I don't want to lie. Um, <laughs> so, uh, but anyway, the the scientific GUIs and the scientific coding tools are are mostly what we use. Um, Python is becoming by and far the most useful thing, especially if you can juggle Python libraries, which uh, tools like Conda is making a lot easier. Um, you can uh, basically download the Python library that that particular science community has written specifically to read their data, and then you load it into like a NumPy array and you can pretty easily create a Houdini asset from there. Um, the, the biggest challenge that we still run into a lot is these um, non-uniform, non-rectangular uh, volume grids. Um, you know, we have these, these stretch grids that are rectangular, but there's more resolution in different dimensions. Um, we have multi-resolution grids like the adaptive mesh refinement. We have a ton of polar data. Um, and so when we're trying to bring this into Houdini, we have to sort of balance on this seesaw of like oversampling and undersampling. If we uh, uh, want to have uniform voxels, we will typically try to find a, a middle ground, but that will mean that we're putting a lot of detail in empty areas and we're blurring out a lot of detail in the, in the finer resolution areas. So I'll, I'll mention a little bit later some new techniques we have for that. Um, so data, uh, like uh, geometry derivation is uh, another important technique that we do a lot of. We, um, you know, some, we, we kind of get these big uh, black boxes of data and they don't, they're not always self-describing. Um, and so we'll create a, a sort of corollary data from the original data. Uh, so this is an example of um, isosurfaces, which are kind of the 3D equivalent of iso lines that you see in terrain maps. Um, so it's basically a, a division between uh, one value and another. Um, and uh, uh, this is, in this simulation, it's showing kind of a, sh uh, a shell around a coronal mass ejection, or a series of coronal mass ejections. Um, and this is like the easiest thing in the world to do with VDBs. Uh, there's literally that ISO value parameter on the convert VDB node. Um, so, uh, so very pleased to have access to that. I also want to shout out, um, this visualization was created by my intern Anansa over the summer, and I'm very proud of her. She did a great job. Um, when we are dealing with vector field data, uh, tracing lines is often a really useful way to show kind of what's happening in that volume. Um, so you can see kind of the reddish purplish lines there are the magnetic field, and uh, we do that just with the, um, the uh, volume trail stop. Um, and then the, the yellow lines are actually reacting to the uh, evolving volume field, and so that's a pop simulation that uh, uses the advec by volume uh, pop node. So uh, we go through a look development process with pretty much every data set that we're working with. Um, I really like this example. It's just four different views of the same colliding galaxy data set, but you can see that sort of based on the story you're trying to tell, there might be different attributes in the data that you want to pull out. Um, so my, my uh, old colleague Stuart put together these, these different images where you can see like areas of star formation and the directions that the stars are traveling and where the gas and dust are traveling to and coming from. Um, so any one of these might be like the correct approach to visualizing this data set uh, depending on your story. And so we'll kind of go through this, this process of figuring that out, like what we want to show and what we don't. Um, this visualization is of carbon dioxide around the planet and it's colored by the different uh, sources of carbon dioxide. So the sort of yellow golden color there is fossil fuels. So that was what we really cared about. But uh, when we got this data set, like every voxel in the data has some positive value for carbon dioxide, right? Like, like the sky, the, the atmosphere is full of carbon dioxide. Um, and if we hadn't carved away the low values of carbon dioxide, you would just see this big gray sphere and nothing underneath it, right? The, there would just be diffuse gas everywhere. Um, so we, you know, we intentionally carved away low values so that you could see the high values and you could kind of see over time the, I'm gonna scrub to the end, you can kind of see that uh, 
that build up over time. And that's really the story, right? You don't want to show like naive reality. You want to show uh, kind of the scientific point you're trying to make. Um, this, uh, I'm sure, is, is a familiar exercise to anyone who's done look dev before, um, who's, anyone who's worked with a client before. Um, in our case, our clients tend to be uh, sort of science storytellers and the scientists themselves, and there's always this tension where the scientist wants us to be as absolutely perfectly accurate as possible, and the storyteller wants to get the point across and is willing to uh, ditch details uh, at a second's notice. Um, and I think that's a really healthy tension to have. I think that both of those are important, but sometimes people just need an image to react to. Um, and so I just would love to sing Houdini's praises for making it really easy to uh, rapidly prototype different things. So this is an experiment in like, what, what does a photon look like? Which, you know, at this scale, like the wavelength of a photon is bigger than the screen, so. Um, so, okay, so everyone's been talking about HDAs. Uh, we have a bunch of HDAs in our studio. Um, one of the things that uh, is sort of a repeated challenge that we've had to build tools around is bringing different data sets together. We really want to try and make science as understandable as possible, and to do that, we want to connect the familiar to the unfamiliar. And so uh, we'll go out and find different data sets. These different data sets are not computed to go together. They, they weren't originally intended to, to synchronize well. Um, and so uh, some of the challenges that we run into are like timing, right? So like some uh, simulations will run for a long time, some will be short, they'll be at different cadences, some will have dropped uh, time steps, um, some have non-uniform timing. Um, and so to deal with this, we have this date mapper, file mapper uh, process that we've come up with. So um, the date mapper basically stores time as this uh, specific kind of float called a modified Julian date or an MJD. Um, and so in the date mapper, we can basically, you know, we can calculate and then we can uh, see all of the details of the actual time that that float translates to. And then we can animate time just with that MJD value. And then when we feed that MJD into the file mapper, we can create file name strings that um, specifically refer to the original data file names, which is really important for a thing called data provenance, where like if you're actually doing scientific research and someone like looks at your visualization and they want to know like where did that phenomenon come from, you can go back and actually find the original source data that created it without having any like externally renamed files so that you can use $f4 or whatever. So matching times is one thing, matching uh, uh, coordinate space is another. Um, this is an animation my colleague Greg did. Uh, he like hand-coded all these different map projections, which is uh, mathematically stupid, um, but he did it. Uh, so, so these are just coordinate systems on the surface of the Earth, um, but the, you know when we do things in space, like coordinate systems get really wacky because Everything's spinning, everything's spinning at a tilt, everything is processing, everything has an orbital plane. None of those orbital planes are exactly the same. Um, you know, phenomena like space weather and uh, asteroid collisions can slightly change everything so that it's not even deterministic. You have to kind of update things as events happen. Um, and so, uh, so it'd be really nice to just do like a very easy procedural like thing looping around an ellipse um, but you can't uh, when you're trying to be accurate. So there's a, a library called Spice, or a, yeah, a tool called Spice that has um, Python bindings, but uh, we, we will use Spice basically to look up transformation matrices and, uh, and to transform, uh, you know, like satellite uh, trajectory paths into the coordinate spaces of our scenes. Um, and so in order to do that, we also have an HDA that will write spice code for us. This was written by my colleague, Kel Elkins. Um, and, uh, and yeah, that spice is normally sort of a thing that everyone cringes about, but this makes it a lot easier to work with spice. Um, so color mapping is one of the most important uh, uh, techniques in data visualization, it's a thing that a lot of people get really passionate about. There's a lot of um, argument about over how to do it correctly. Everyone will always tell you, like, never use the rainbow color map. There's all these scientific reasons that the co rainbow color map is evil. Um, 
So, uh, so there are libraries, and it's still kind of the Wild West, um, but we, uh, my colleague Greg created this HDA that allows us to um, query a, a database that we have downloaded of about 2,000 color ramps from different sources, and uh, it will actually also build geometry for a um, color, color ramp legend. Um, so we can like annotate our visualizations and actually say like this density value translates to this color on the color ramp. Okay, so I mentioned I was gonna come back to uh, volume resampling. So this is, you don't have to really read this, but this was just for my own benefit, writing down all the different ways that we've loaded volumes into, uh, into um, design software over the years. Um, the, uh, it's, it's always been a struggle because you always are giving up detail and, and uh, you wanna represent the scientist data as accurate, accurately as you can. Uh, so before I talk about my, my favorite current solutions, I do just want to point out that these online resources were super helpful to me. I bet they would be useful to other people here. Um, I also want to call out a friend, John Parker, who has done a lot of visualization for the Hayden Planetarium in New York. Uh, he solved this even before I did and uh, helped me to think about it in sort of a bigger picture way. Um, so, uh, so technique number one, point cloud shading. So, uh, what we'll do is we'll, we'll um, what I was saying earlier, use Python to read uh, the scientific data uh, voxels into a NumPy array and then turn that NumPy array into a point cloud. So we'll get points that represent the, um, the voxel values. Uh, this, by the way, this is like a super simple introductory setup. This is not a scientific data line. <laughs> um, but, uh, but essentially, you have this, this uh, point cloud that represents the centers of the voxels in whatever shape they chose to use. Um, you create a very modest resolution volume uh, in, in the bounding box around that, and then uh, use these uh, PC open and PC filter uh, nodes in the sh VEX nodes in the shader to um, basically look up as, as the, uh, ray tracer is going through the volume, it, it looks up a, a value not from the geometry volume, but from the point cloud. Um, and that's, uh, that's basically meant that we're no longer sampling, we're no longer resampling the scientific volume at the geometry level, but at the pixel level, which is a lot more representative of the real data. And um, more recently, what we realized that you can also do this with meshes. So um, we'll create tetrahedral mesh meshes from the point cloud where the points represent the voxels in the scientific data. Um, and then we can use that XYZ dist lookup and um, find like the nearest edge. And this tends to work a lot better with um, uh, point cloud or you know, voxel data that the voxels have like orders of magnitude of different scale. Um, the point clouds sort of get a little bit confused by that, but the, the um, XYZ disk lookup is, is more consistent. So both of these methods have uh, limitations, but um, they've helped us get a lot closer to uh, being accurate to the source data, which uh, I'm thrilled about. Um, and then uh, I also just kind of wanted to mention, we do a lot of rendering for non-standard displays. Um, our team at NASA is uh, responsible for maintaining a, a wide variety of large uh, flat screen displays that are called hyperwalls. Um, and so there's a variety of formats and we um, will kind of render to all of them um, at super high resolution, which uh, in, you know, other software that we've used has been a lot more problematic, but Houdini is very stable about doing high resolution imagery, which is great. Um, we've also done a ton of uh, uh, digital full dome rendering, like I mentioned, uh, with Houdini. Um, in the past, the way that you used to create these dome master images was that you would render the same scene five times. So you'd have a forward camera, an up camera, a down camera, a left camera, and a right camera, and then you'd use external stitching software to like reproject those five sort of cube map images into a, into a hemisphere. Um, huge waste of resources, <laughs> terrible, absolutely terrible. Um, but with the lens shaders uh, that Houdini, Houdini has, we've, um, we've been able to just render directly to Dome Master, which is great. 
Uh, and more recently, we've, um, we've been working with NOAA on this uh, display format called Science on a Sphere, um, which is you know, just kind of like a, what is it, like six feet in diameter, um, and it's just a sphere. There's hundreds of these distributed across um, muse museums and science centers around the world. And uh, the, the image format for these is just an equirectangular map. And so the sort of basic default that most people, most science centers use this for is to show something on the Earth, something on the moon, something on the sun, something on a, on a round body. Um, but I just thought that this was a really fun example. Uh, we, we used lens shaders again to create like an equirectangular rendering of a 3D environment. Um, and ended up creating this, this uh, basically fishbowl uh, pr projection, which, you know, if you like unwrap this, it, like, it's a completely nonsensical rectangular image, but when you put it on a sphere, it actually looks like you're looking at a, like a real container of fluid. So um, this, uh, that's kind of the, the Houdini stuff I wanted to mention, but I'm sure people in the audience are like, what the hell is this good for? Um, so I do just kind of want to make a, a, a pitch that this is like important for uh, the world. Um, the, uh, when the NASA agency was first founded, the, the act that chartered it in 1958 called for the agency to provide for the widest practical and appropriate dissemination of information concerning NASA activities and the results thereof. So the visualization work that we're doing is actually key to the science mission of the agency. It's actually part of the scientific process. Um, that's important because we want people to, be, uh, to grow up to be scientists. It's important because we want people to support our work because we want to be funded. Um, what, what you learn when in, you're in this field is that people seek out education for entertainment, right? People pay to go to museums. People spend money on documentary films. Um, and people have an easier time learning when they're having fun. And so that's really something that we try to lean into especially. Um, we also have found that uh, uh, compelling imagery can really capture people's attention in uh, the news. Um, we did this, uh, this rising sea level visualization, which could have just been a graph, right? This is like 30 years of sea level height. Um, it could have very easily just been a sort of a zigzaggy line that goes up, but the director of our team, Mark Subarau, had this clever idea, like what if we like really go all out and make it a VFX simulation of an ocean um, and show it through a boat porthole? And, uh, and when we published this, I didn't expect anyone to even notice that it had happened, and then it got picked up by all these uh, news agencies, and they all wanted to talk about how terrifying it was and how we were all gonna die. So, um, <laughs> so anyway, that was a lesson for me that, that um, there's a lot of impact that can come from this. Um, and then also, this is the kind of stuff that really uh, more often than not gets shared with decision makers um, and people with big audiences, right? Because these people aren't scientific experts. And so we need things that uh, are, are intuitive, enough, intuitive enough for them to understand that they can just look at it and understand uh, sort of the scientific points. So my little collage here, uh, you see our work being presented to the vice president, being presented at a, a diplomacy conference in Dubai, um, being presented to some NASA administrators in the bottom left, and our uh, good friend Leonardo DiCaprio in the bottom right, um, who is famously kind of an advocate for climate uh, activism. So um, all of these people have different audiences and they need to be able to talk intelligently about the, uh, the information that NASA has, and we, I am proud to say, play a role in that. So, um, so yeah, so uh, it's, uh, it's an important thing now because there's a lot of confusion around climate change and that's sort of a grand challenge that we're facing now. Um, on a smaller scale, there's all kinds of different natural disasters that we're helping to prepare people for, both with uh, you know, weather on the planet and space weather. Um, it helps kids to develop uh, their science identity, right? Like I was saying, we want kids to grow up to wanna be scientists. Um, I think I personally had that uh, journey when I watched the show Walking with Dinosaurs as a kid, and so uh, I hope that I'm sort of providing that to some other kid um, these days. And, uh, and yeah, like, uh, also, like, just a picture's worth a thousand words. Uh, people understand things better if they can see them. 
so that's pretty much everything I wanted to talk about. I, if, in case anyone was interested in getting started with scientific visualization, I wanted to share some resources here. Um, but I'm also happy to take questions. And I want to say thank you so much to SideFX for having me here. The second. Thank you. Um, how do you deal with the scale, and how do you make sure that all the data sets and everything that you're getting is processed in a way that it lives in the same world? Yeah, you mean like the uh, the virtual scale, not like the size of the. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so uh, yeah, it's a huge challenge. Um, in a, I think in a, a VFX pipeline, you would skip this challenge, right? You would, exactly. you would uh, just cut or whatever. Um, so we like we run into floating point round off a lot. Um, we sort of have a lot of setups where like you know you'll be flying from like the Earth to the Sun, and and you never really think about this until you're doing it in a VFX program. But like the Earth is tiny and far away, and the sun is tiny and far away, and then you have to like, like put one of those at the center of your scene. So anyway, we'll create a, a scene setup where like we'll, we'll actually change coordinate systems as we're traveling between them. Um, so like the Earth is at the center of the scene while you're at Earth, and then like magic sleight of hand, suddenly the sun is at the center of the scene when you get to it. Um, there's uh, there's a lot of like just trying to find like you know we tend to not use scene units as meters we tend to try and find a unit that that is like right in the middle of the large uh, range of scales that we'll be crossing but it's it's a thing that creates a lot of uh, computational issues and we spend more time on it than we would like to yeah you're definitely right can you do some kind of visual tricks that you know you're gonna cut and suddenly you're at a different scale or like, you know, you just snap to a different position or something, or does it always need to be like really, you know, scientifically accurate and... Yeah, I, it, so like we almost never cut um, for the reasons I was saying about like trying to yep. uh, keep your sense of place mm -hmm. in the scene. Um, but we will do things where we like crossfade, right? Where you like, you think you're looking at the same thing, but you're actually looking at something at a completely different scale. So there is definitely some sleight of hand, but we try to make it as seamless as possible. Yeah, that's cool. Thanks. How do you render uh, all this scientific data? Do you have a render form? Yes, yes. There's a, there's a render form at NASA that is uh, sort of hand-me-down supercomputers. Um, so yeah, we've, we run uh, RenderMan and Mantra, and we're starting to experiment with Karma, I'm happy to say. So those calculation or for rendering? So the, the um, supercomputers I showed photos of, uh, I have used the supercomputers for rendering, but typically the idea is that those are specifically just for scientific computer models. Um, so they, they, you know, they'll run a huge simulation for weeks or months on, on uh, like just take over the entire computer of thousands and thousands of nodes. Um, you know, those, those machines are bigger than a lot of render farms. Uh, although, actually, there are some big render farms, too. But, um, yeah, sorry, does that answer your question? Yes, thank yeah. you. Um, thank you for the great pre presentation. Um, I have a few questions, and the first question is that, uh, do you do ever, uh, not ever, but do you do um, real-time um, interactive simulation, too? Um, yeah, so this is, I, I, I've chatted with a few people uh, here this week already about this. Um, it's an, an area of interest, um, but it's also a challenge. So we've, so like, there was a big solar eclipse back in April, and we made like a little uh, Unity video game to promote it. Um, calling that data visualization is generous, I think. Uh, it, was, it was mostly like a 2D like photography game that was supposed to kind of teach the concepts of like what an eclipse is and what a, like a solar transit is. Um, so there's definitely people in the team that have familiarity with uh, interactive uh, development, but um, 
the, some of the challenges that we run into are like a lot of the data that we work with are these massive volumetric data sets and like rendering large evolving volumes in real time, especially when you're trying, so the other thing is that it's like anyone in the agency who's doing uh, graphics development has been strongly encouraged to do it uh, for WebGL first because that's the easiest thing to distribute to the public. Um, and that severely limits like the memory footprint that you can use. Uh, so, um, so yeah, rendering evolving volumes has been like a thing that like if anyone can tell me how to do that in WebGL, I am sold. Uh, but, um, but then the other question is just like how do you how do you design like a real time data visualization experience where um, people are finding the important features in a way that justifies like building a whole like software application as compared to like a, a short film, right? Like, like when we create a video, we know that anyone can use it because uh, it's just an MP4 that plays in a web browser. And uh, we know that we can point the camera at a phenomenon when the phenomenon is happening. And so they kind of get the science narrative. Anyway, I'm going really deep into this, but it's, it's definitely a thing that I think I would like to do a, a lot more of, but um, there are some challenges in how we would do it well and how would we technically achieve it. It's not like I have a concrete idea about that, but um, um, I think that there are still like uh, so much like possibilities. Like for example, um, I wonder like um, when you decide like what to visualize, like how much freedom you have just the general like process to decide what to visualize, and then that that uh, related to the the, the other um, my own other question that um, like for example, it's not only like your fine or beautiful um, and accurate results, um, please um, the scientists, but uh, over that, like, was there any time that you made them surprised to find new, new, new things? Because it's like a multi-dimensional. Yeah. Like what you made. So. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So yeah. So the um, the when we were doing documentary work at the supercomputing center, I think it was very, very intended for the public. But at NASA, what I do is considered part of the scientific discovery process. It's definitely part of, of um, science research. And so, uh, so actually, uh, something I tend to say in my talks but I forgot to mention is that we will often do the visualization in two different ways, um, which I also think is just good use of resources because we've already gone to the effort of getting everything into Houdini anyway. Um, but, you know, like a scientist will want to be able to hold a ruler up to the screen and be like, oh, this is, this is three centimeters, you know. Um, whereas an audience, like a public, uh, like a non-expert is not going to care about that at all. They're just going to want to be inspired by the uh, scientific phenomenon. And, and the ultimate goal there is to try to get them curious enough that they'll go out and seek more information that they can find online or whatever. Um, so yeah, so we'll, we'll definitely uh, try to create things that are for the scientist, and they very frequently will look at it and be like, oh yeah, like I sort of knew that that was like what was happening, oh, but yeah. it's like, it's a lot more visceral and tangible when you, when you see the visualization put together. That. Yeah, yeah. I, I think I, I was like, there must be the, some, 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 um, the area like a blended area between like a simulation, pure simulation, and the visualization. Yes. And I guess that you might do kind of uh, like a blending. Yeah. Well, <laughs> <those> and, areas. <laughs> I mean, th in in that sense, like Houdini is a scientific tool, and I am doing science, right? And that one of the things, like, kind of going back to the question about, do you? make things for uh, interactive, um, the, uh, you know, we as visualization designers have come to realize that the process that we go through to visualize the data is a very strong science learning process that if we could put that process into the hands of everyone, every member of the public, like everyone would be a science genius. <laughs> uh, not saying that I'm a science genius, but uh, I definitely have some deep knowledge about some narrow topics. Um, so, uh, so yeah, so I definitely think that, that uh, using Houdini as a scientific research tool is a thing that people can 
learn from, definitely. I think that's really beautiful. And so my final question is like related to the, the screen that uh, with the, um, this information, then do you think that anybody who is interested in this area can make something similar to like what you are doing or, or yeah. like you have a lot more data or computational models that you yeah. have compared to? <laughs> yeah, so I, I really held back on the simulation data box over there because I, it was either list everything or list nothing. Um, the, there are, uh, so, so like the NASA Open Data Portal is a great place to go and you can download any, any kind of uh, research data that has been created. It's like, a lot of it is sort of uh, opaque and you uh, might need some help sort of understanding how to, how to pull it apart using Python tools or whatever. Um, but usually there's a, there's a researcher name that you can reach out to. People try to be really helpful in the agency. Um, you know, I'm happy to be a resource as well, so if anyone wants to reach out to me, I can try to put you in contact. But also NASA is one of a trillion places that's producing scientific three-dimensional data. Um, I Honestly, that last bullet is gonna be the, the, the most important advice I could give anyone who wants to do this. Don't ask a professor. <laughs> Professors are busy people and they don't wanna work with you. Grad students are hungry for this kind of collaboration reach out to a grad student. Just like, you know, maybe you'll find out about the professor's work and be like, that's really cool, but figure out who their grad student is and ask them. They would be thrilled to work with you, I promise. Uh, I'm, I'm a professor, so I agree with you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, okay. Thank you so you know, much. You know. yeah. <laughs> Just building on that last question, um, have you uh, obviously worked with schools, with universities, um, you've got relationships there. Uh, has there been a situation where you might have given an HDA to a school where they've actually used it as a learning device in their program? Um, no, and the reason for that is that HDAs are actually kind of a new thing to us, mm. um, which I'm thrilled about. Uh, the, so when we were at the Super Computing Center, we would basically work on a shot for like a year to two years, and, um, and we would sort of consider it like a one-off, and so it never seemed important to us to create like reusable tools because everything felt like a new challenge that we were solving every time. Um, there were a few things like that, like I was mentioning, like this file mapper, date mapper that I think even those projects could have benefited from. But like we didn't, we never got invested in the HDA uh, uh, architecture because uh, it didn't seem that useful to us. The NASA team though, the way that we work is that everyone on the team is kind of individually creating their own visualizations. And so what HDAs have allowed us to do is like standardize the look of a lot of things, help, help each other solve problems that the others of us have solved already. Um, and so it's become a major part of our uh, workflow at NASA, but we've only been doing it for a couple years at NASA and um, you know, several of the ones that I shared have only been written in the past six months. So, uh, so yeah, if anyone's interested in, in uh, looking at these HDAs, I think we would be happy to talk to them about that, but um, so far haven't had an opportunity to share yet. I think it'd be neat if you connect with our education team who's got the tentacles into the schools uh, and we can actually try that as a pilot program in one of the science programs somewhere. It'd be yeah. super cool. Yeah. Yeah, 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 that'd be great. Thank you for the presentation. Um, I'm very curious, like where do you get your creative direction from? Like in a traditional VFX pipeline, you might have a storyboard, some artwork to start with. In your case, I've just been given a bunch of data and you have to come up with uh, something that looks like something that makes yeah. kind of sense. Are you getting any creative brief from the scientists directly? Like uh, where do you start? Yeah, um, that's a great question. So, uh, at the Supercomputing Center, the director of our team, Donna Cox, uh, was a, a fine arts professor. Um, and so she always had a very good critical eye on, on the like, creativity of things and would give us all uh, strong creative direction. Um, at NASA, there's, I think there's a very strong reliance on uh, sort of the, the strength of the group Everyone is kind of their own director for every visualization that they're working on. Um, but we have weekly, we, you know, we call them weeklies. Uh, it's not dailies, but we meet once a week and everyone sort of shares what they're working on. And then um, everyone in the group just tears it apart. Uh, and, and um, you know, a lot of the advice 
is not only uh, creative direction, but also sort of best practices direction. You know, like I talked about color mapping, right? Like there's, there's all kinds of academic knowledge in our group about like what colors are good for this and that. Um, so, uh, so yeah, it's, it's still up to like me, the individual uh, visualizer, to take the advice I've been given and choose kind of how to realize it. Um, but, uh, but yeah, ultimately I think it's, it's a lot fuzzier than in the studio system. It's, it's definitely self-driven. But so when you ingest your data for the very first time, are you at least being given some kind of guideline of what everything means? Or oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, God, I would be so lost if I wasn't, yeah. I, we, we definitely have to talk to the scientists. I'll, I'll, a lot of scientists are actually pretty confident with creating their own sort of diagrammatic visualizations. They've got custom tools, the Python tools that will do that. Um, and uh, so I'll ask them to share any sort of preliminary visualizations they have. I'll ask them to describe the structure of their data. I'll ask them which fields I should be like looking for certain features inside of. Um, you know, like the, the green uh, magnetosphere. I thought, oh, it's a magnetosphere. I should look in the magnetic field. It was like, no, 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 you should be looking in the current field. So um, those are things that you would never know if the scientist wasn't holding your hand through the sort of beginning of the process. Thank you. Uh, what? Well, the last question. Uh, if a kid was interested in doing what you do, what would you advise them to study in school? You know, visual effects, science, you know, are there programs that are sort of merging the two of those fields? Um, I think that it's, it, this is like a field that a lot of people stumble into and they don't find intentionally. And I think we're gonna see that changing in the future. Um, I, the, I know like Texas A&M has a visualization, like a dedicated visualization program. I, I think universities uh, in a lot of places are starting to, to build up visualization programs. Um, I, I know people in the industry who have come from VFX. I know people in the, in the industry who have astrophysics PhDs. Um, I personally started in computer science but, uh, but I think it's kind of just like know that it's your interest and practice it in the background regardless of, of the approach you're taking to get there. Thank you very much, AJ. Thanks. Thanks, guys.